Greetings, greetings. Thank you for coming. I'm Ken Ludwig, and I'm thrilled you're here to talk about Baskerville. I'm, by the way, doing this tra transmission since we have a lot of foreign visitors uh, from Washington, D.C., where I live. Uh, a Baskerville is a stage adaptation I read about six years ago of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Hound of the Baskervilles. And I'm thrilled that we're gonna be joined in about a minute by Ryan McBride, who is the artistic director of the Mercury Theater in the United Kingdom, and also director of their current production of Baskerville, which I'm proud to say is, has opened their brand new complex that they just built, uh, a, 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 a new gorgeous uh, a Mercury Theater in Colchester, England. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. And I'll introduce him in a minute. Let me talk about a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, or just at least let me tell you that this event is part of something I created about six months ago, which is a comedy play club. My thought was, that this is a chance to, to talk about stage comedies with really great uh, um, talents uh, uh, and performers and directors from around the world. And some of the uh, uh, comedies we'll look at in the months to come, some will be by me and others will be really great uh, uh, works of English literature, Shakespeare, Noel Coward, things as late as uh, uh, One Man, Two Governors. And, and, and I have a mission here. The reason I've done this is because I want, it's twofold. One is I want people to, to, to read, start reading plays the way we read novels. And secondly, uh, I want people to start reading and seeing more comedies. Uh, I, I, they're sort of an underused asset in the world, I think. You know, we, everybody says, oh, the tragedies are, are, are serious literature, comedies are not. I, I don't believe that. And if there's ever a time we need uh, comedies, it seems to me it, it's right now. Um, uh, you can get details of, of, of uh, future Play Club meetings by signing up to our newsletter. Uh, my manager, the great Rosie Strube, is behind the scenes right now doing all this, making all this work. And she's gonna drop into the chat uh, 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 function there where you can sign up for um, uh, uh, our newsletter and then know that we'll be doing more of these. So now let me introduce uh, Ryan McBride, a great man of the theater. Uh, he's directed uh, plays all over Europe and the United Kingdom. He, he did a, apparently one that, that's a, a musical recently um, uh, that it was re renowned all over the place. And I've heard on good authority that he also doesn't like sprouts and he's a Torian. So Ryan, join us. <laughs> hello, Ken, and hello, everyone. Lovely to be here. Lovely to be uh, with you tonight. We've just um, we've just had our show here, so we've just finished. So I, I'm here. I am in the auditorium at at the Mercury. Just give it there, and that's you can just see Baker Street down the bottom there. So everyone's just just exited, and I think our actors are joining us uh, in a little bit. Fingers crossed. Oh, great. Good. So um, is is Ryan Froze? Are oh, you still there? Good. Great. Sorry. We're doing this in through, by the way, Rosie's doing this from Seattle in the United States. I'm in, or, or, or Ashley and I are in Washington, DC, and you guys are in England. So this covers 6,000 miles. This is a pretty good feat. Okay. And, and now let me introduce, we're gonna be joined by my colleague, Ashley Polisek. We now work together. She's an expert in all things Sherlock Holmes. She's a, a, a fellow member with me of the Baker Street Irregulars. Her PhD, is in adaptation studies with a specialty in Sherlock Holmes. She's the editor of the Conan Doyle Review and she's a regular consultant on films about uh, um, uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, uh, including uh, Enola Holmes, which was on Netflix recently. So it couldn't be a, a more appropriate and more perfect person to moderate uh, this discussion. So Ashley, welcome. Thanks very much, Ken. Uh so just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, we do have the chat feature enabled. I see we have people already uh, chatting up a storm. That's great. By all means, enjoy a lively discussion. Let us know where you're zooming in from. Uh, and if you're currently producing Baskerville or you are gonna be producing it in the near future, do please let us know that as well. Let people know where they can find your productions. Today's play club is gonna last about an hour. We're going to start with a discussion between Ken and Ryan, and we'll have time at the end for questions. So if you have questions for Ken or Ryan, 
type them into the Q&A box. Rosie's gonna be monitoring that for us. So thank you, Rosie, for that. Uh, and also just a note to let you know, we are recording today's discussion. So let's talk a little bit about the play. Uh, Ken Lovick's Baskerville is an adaptation of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's 1901 novella, The Hound of the Baskervilles. And just for a little perspective, Sherlock Holmes is literature's most adapted character and Hound is the most frequently adapted Sherlock Holmes story. There are dozens of versions on film, on television, on radio uh, and stage, of course. Ken's play is a fresh take on the tale for a number of reasons. Like all of Ken's mystery and thrillers, uh, it highlights the ties that uh, between the genre, the mystery thriller genre and the comedy genre more broadly. So while it thrills as an adaptation of the Holmes adventure in and of itself, it's also really a play about plays. It's cast of five, covers about 40 roles in this tour de force of joyful theatricality. So I know many of you who are tuning in have read the play. A lot of you have seen it. Certainly the folks who are in, at Mercury have just walked out of the auditorium. Uh, but those of you who haven't, Ken, can you tell us why Sherlock Holmes, why The Hound of the Baskervilles in particular was appealing for you for an adaptation? Sure. Uh, and thank you for saying those nice things. Uh, I paid her big money to say those nice things. Uh, it is, uh, when I was, had finished whatever latest play about six years ago I'd done, I love just writing plays. It's what I do. It's all I do. It's very sad, but I just sit in home and write plays. It is I was really looking for something new to write. And I walk and, walked around my library, which I'm in right now. And um, and I and I saw uh, The Hound of the Baskerville sticking out and I reread it. And, uh, and, and I thought my, I was struck with who doesn't love Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson and, and who wouldn't want them to come to life. Actually, at that moment in time, I sort of didn't know that there was a, a substantial stage literature about them. Uh, and, and in reading the, the novella, it's a, you know, it is a short novel. It's one of his four novels about, about Holmes. He also wrote, uh, Conan Doyle wrote 56 short stories. Uh, is that um, there's a couple of peculiar things about it. And, and one is that, uh, first of all, I think it's one of the two great adventure stories of all time in, the, in, in English. I'd say the other one's Treasure Island. It's just a personal opinion, but it, it's, it's a great novel. Uh, it's so exciting and touching and deep and it's wonderful. Uh, and, but what Conan Doyle did when he, when he created Sherlock Holmes uh, is he instantly created a myth. And, and, and how many times in the history of English literature does that happen? And the answer is, it seems to me, is not very often. Uh, you know, I can I count it on one hand, the ones I can think of at the moment. Uh, um, uh, the Three Musketeers, that's not English literature, but that's certainly all at once fell swoop. Dumas created a myth. And, and he did that, uh, uh, Hamlet does that, uh, 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 James Bond, uh, Jeeves and Wooster, and there are probably a few other examples, but where somebody makes a creation that becomes part of us, becomes part of our DNA. There is not a time that we were living that we don't remember we knew something about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. So that made it kind of really attractive to do it. The other thing that struck me at the time is, the, is that the novel is quite short. It is a novella. And, and yet, it's filled with lots of locations and tons of characters. It starts out starts out at Baskerville Hall, and then it goes to, uh, and I guess it, it starts out, the novel starts out right in London in Holmes' study. And then it, and then it, it gonna, gonna go to the Downs uh, of Devon, where the quicksand can suck you in and, and, and you're glub, 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 and you're gone. And, uh, and it's got a uh, big, uh, a huge cast of colorful characters. And what, what attracted me about it was that, hey, this is a chance to be really theatrical in some way. I didn't know at first, but how to take this big story and put it on a small stage. So that, that's kind of uh, why I did it. That's great. So a really rich source text to work from. Uh, Ryan, out of all the plays in the world you could have chosen to open your new complex there, why did you decide to start with uh, Ken's play Baskerville? Uh, I guess it's because uh, 
audiences love a thriller, don't they? They love a, a whodunit, the murder mystery. That's our, in, in, certainly in the UK, that's one of our biggest selling, you know, they love the gaslights, they love the dilemmas for murder, all of those sorts of shows. But also they love uh, Sherlock. Sherlock is, as Ken was saying, is such a phenomenon. You know, just this year, you've had uh, Netflix do The Irregulars and Enola Holmes, haven't they? They've just been uh, produced. And then you've got, obviously, Mr. Cumberbatch playing it. You've got Robert Downey Jr. You've even got um, Johnny Lee Miller playing it in elementary. So it's huge. Um, so we knew that Holmes was a, a big seller. Um, and this particular version is so funny. Uh, and as Ken alluded to at the beginning, when we're just coming out of the pandemic. We're also coming out of two years of refurbishing the theatre. We wanted a show that was going to make people laugh. So we get both, we get the, we get the best of both worlds here. We get the murder mystery and we get the, um, we get the comedy. Uh, and I suppose also the reason I went for this one, because there's, there's several versions of homes around the country at the moment um, of, of basketball in particular. I think there's four productions of basketball playing, but wow. not this particular, not, not Ken's one. Um, I have to say we're, we're, the, we're the proud um, presenters of Ken's version of it. There's, there's other versions of it around the country. And I think it's it's the great story that he you know that that draws people in, um, but uh, yeah, and and the kind of the and the adventure of it, yeah. But what the reason we went for Ken's was because it's so wonderfully theatrical. You've got five actors playing forty three characters over a hundred costume changes. Uh, I think there's twenty seven locations that we're jumping backwards and forwards to. So yeah, that's that. What I kept asking myself, having spent a year binge watching Netflix uh, shows, what can what can the theatre offer? That um, that the um, that the that Netflix can't, and it's that theatricality, that innate celebration of everything theatre. That's wonderful. Yeah, Holmes and Watson are such iconic characters. Um, Ken, you really do set the tone of this as a comedy in your own unique voice as a comic playwright right from the beginning of the play. How do you how do you go about doing that? Well, thanks. Uh, I. I... I was, you know, after I read the first draft and so on, I was very conscious of how, how to open it. Well, my, in, in a sense, you could say, like all good comedies, it begins with this vicious murder. <laughs> but you, you need to get the audience's attention, you know? Uh, it, so this version, uh, the novella starts in the study with Holmes and Watson, but here it starts with that first murder. So Charles Baskerville, he comes out of his... Uh, of his um, a uh, uh, house and he goes to his back garden and he lights a cigar and he hears these footsteps of this gigantic hound. It was the footsteps of the gigantic, a gigantic hound and, and, and it, and it murdered and, and he's murdered. And, uh, and then it moves. So that's number one, because the theatricality of creating the idea of a hound and the sounds and, and the lights on this one person, uh, he has only one line other than, Oh, 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 um, uh, <laughs> Is it is that then what I did was I went straight to the study Sherlock Holmes's study, uh, where you meet Sherlock and and Watson and a uh, the first this client comes in Dr Mortimer but all the while there's this shy small a small character when I say small because she's she's scrubbing the floor she's and her name's Daisy and she's the scullery maid and we don't think much about her, but when Dr Mortimer this client comes in and starts to read to them from the manuscript, the ancient manuscript about the legend of the Hound of the Baskervilles, which he's there to consult Holmes about. She changes before our life, uh, before our eyes, and, and she becomes a different character and she changes gender. And suddenly little Daisy is Sir Hugo Baskerville from the 17th century, who's a, this larger than life evil character who, uh, who calls on the hounds to, 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 to track down a, a distressed uh, woman who's running away. And so it seemed to me that was a great way to, from the beginning, tell the audience, this is the vocabulary of the play. Uh, uh, so hold on tight, you know, hopefully we're here for a, a fun adventure. That uh, changing from one character to another in that dramatic way is uh, certainly <laughs> putting a lot of responsibility on the director. Ryan, how do you go about bringing all these characters to life, especially in terms of casting and directing a play like this? Uh, yeah, it's 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 an interesting challenge. Um, so 
in our auditions, what we made our auditionees do is we asked each of them to prepare a line from each of the different characters. So often they think there's like 10 characters. So they, and then they had to do a kind of transition from character to character. So we could see how quickly they could transform from one character to the next. Uh, and that that instantly, you know, kind of uh, separated the, the sheep from the goats, so to speak. We knew instantly because it's all about the multi-rolling. We knew that's how they would do it. So, um, and actually what's interesting about it as a text is that it's a, it's very rich in, in terms of its language. There's this kind of, um, you know, obviously taking the, the original book uh, and that kind of Victorian uh, sort of uh, language. So finding actors who are adept at the physical comedy and also delivering that kind of uh, the richness of the text, which is kind of, you know, in the, in the kind of same world as coward and wild, it, it isn't an easy ask. And so we were very lucky to find the five actors uh, that we did. In terms of directing it, we we just stole, stole, stole. So, you know, we look, we were looking at kind of Mel Brook movies. We were looking at um, a lot of the uh, the kind of the kind of Basil Rathbone movies, the um, Ian Richardson version of it, uh, looking at Cumberbatch because, and, and, and sending those characters up, which it, it's very easy to do. If you look at the Hammer Horror version of it um, with uh, Christopher Reeves, that, you know, that, that already is kind of bordering on spoof in places. And so actually what you do is you just take those characters, you just turn them up and turn them up. Uh, and, uh, and then yes, it, like, you know, Holmes is vanity. If you just ever so slightly just you just just push that button a little bit more and his kind of his just this amazing ability his genius the smartest man in the room and Watson's hero worship yeah very quickly uh, it kind of moves into a world of humor cool. absolutely uh, well everybody who's watching is now going to get a chance to see how this actually works um, because. Ryan and the folks at Mercury have been kind enough to uh, film a couple of scenes for us from their play. So we're gonna get the pleasure of seeing some of this work in action. Um, Ryan, will you set this scene up for us? Yes, of course I can, yes. No pressure here, no pressure. So, uh, so in the scene that we're about to see, we've got Holmes and Watson. Uh, they've just discovered that um, Sir Henry is being followed by um, a gentleman with a black beard in a carriage. Uh, and so they're going to the Northumberland Hotel to uh, confront Sir Henry and tell him about it. Uh, in the scene that we've got, we've got Sherlock Holmes played by Richard Ede, Dr. Watson played by Eric Stroud, actor one is played by Mark Pickering, actor two by Phil Yarrow, and Naomi Peterson plays actor three. Over to you, Rosie. Well, Watson, we're due at the Northumberland Hotel. And I know the desk clerk there. He's a Castilian. A Castilian. Mr. Holmes, what a pleasure, sir. And Dr. Watson, we read about your exploits in this trial magazine religiously. Sir Henry Baskerville is expecting you upstairs, sir. Thank you. Uh, have you any objection to my looking at your register? Oh, no, not in the least, sir. Mi rigoterio e tu rigoterio. Ah, I see no one's checked in since Sir Henry arrived. That is correct, sir. We like to keep out the riff and the raff because, as you know, this is the most proper hotel in all of London. This is very interesting. If no one's checked in, means that the man in the cab is anxious to watch Sir Henry, oh. but equally as anxious not to be seen by him. You mean he might be recognized? Out of my way! Well, look who's uh, coming. An old friend. Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. Let us hope he does not derail the investigation this time. Well, knock me senseless. It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes. What the hell are you doing here? Hello, Doctor. I'm meeting a client. What about you? They're wasting my time with some piss-pot nonsense about uh, some bleeding baronet. Say, your language, please. What about it? This is a public hostelry, and we have children here. Where? What you have done, I Dios mio, in Spain, yes, the quinto tengo que sepultar, it's a lente, it's a tando, it is crazy under the honor de mi hotel. I am impressed. My mother speaks French too. If you ask me, it's a lot of bollocks about some toff from America who's going to inherit a fortune anyhow. He is my client, actually. Good, because I've got a more important case in Anslow involving some bleeding bastard and, and his naked mistresses. Well, <laughs> This is outrageous! 
Yeah. It's burning the prestige of this hotel and he will ruin us. Oh, darn it. Sir Henry, what's the matter? I'll tell you what the matter is. They're playing me for a sucker in this hotel. And if they don't find my boot, there's going to be trouble. You lost the boot. Not just a boot. It's my favorite pair. And they lost just one of them. Now, does that make any sense in the world? Hey, you! Oh, my God! She's the maid I talked to earlier. Now, miss, have you found my boot yet? Now, tell me the truth, because if you were in on it... Nine, nine! I have not found the boot, I swear! I'm asking the boot black, and he's not with him. And I check in the cupboards, and I check on the shelves, and I make the query. Well, either that boot comes back before sundown, or I'll talk to your manager. I find, I promise, I find das boot! Ah, Dr. Mortimer. Sorry I'm late. Brr, it's cold. Bitter? It's more than bitter. It's downright freezing. Thank you. Yes, it's dank as well. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes. It just gets in my craw when somebody tries to play me for a sucker. I know it ain't important in the scheme of things. No, on the contrary, I believe it's quite important. You do realize you were followed this morning after you left us? Really? By who? Dr. Mortimer, do any of your acquaintances in Devonshire have a black beard? Barrymore does, Sir Charles's butler. And did Barrymore benefit by Sir Charles's will? Well, he and his wife were left 500 pounds each. But I trust the bequest does not make one a suspect. I received, well, <clears throat> 10,000 pounds. That's a lot of money? Yes, it is. Anyone else? He left a bit to a few charities, and the residue went to Sir Henry. And how much was that? 740,000 pounds. Jesus Christ! Excuse me. Quite enough money to provoke a murder, don't you think? When Dr. Mortimer told me the amount of the legacy, I almost fell off my chair. And if anything were to happen to Sir Henry, who would inherit? Well, I have heard talk of a black sheep son of Sir Charles's brother, Roger, but I believe he died some years ago in South America. And you're unmarried? That's right. No children? I hope not, but I couldn't swear to it. Have you made a will? Nope. Well. I agree you should return to Devonshire and claim your inheritance. There is, however, one provisor. You must not go alone. Dr. Mortimer is going with me. But Dr. Mortimer has his practice to attend to, and I presume his house is not near the manor. Yeah, no, four miles away. There you are. And you must take someone trustworthy who will stay by your side. Could you come yourself? Oh, I'm afraid that's impossible. There is a scandal threatening the King of Bohemia which requires my attention at the moment. However... If my friend would agree, you could have no better companion nor any braver. Oh, I say, that's a, that's a kind way to put it. And it would be kind of you, Doctor, if you're up for it. Mm. Well, I, I, I don't know that I'm the right man for the job. But, uh, what I'll do. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> the matter's concluded. When shall we depart? Shall we say Paddington Station today at four? Done. Done. <laughs> I love that. It makes me uh, envious that I can't be there to go see it. Uh, this is a great scene. It includes some very recognizable Conan Doyle characters. We have Holmes and Watson for the Sherlockians who are tuning in. Of course, we also have Inspector Lestrade, Sir Henry Baskerville, Dr. Mortimer. Uh, but Ken, this also includes some of the original characters that you created to enhance the story and, and really populate this play with a lot of interesting folks. How did you come up with, for instance, the, the Spanish hotel clerk. I, I was muted and I'm now unmuted. Can you hear me? What's happening in my, uh, uh, um, where I am is, it is teeming down right at the minute and I have skylights. So it's really noisy in here. Can you hear me? Is that, can you hear me okay? We okay. can hear you just fine. Good. Can't hear the rain. Okay. And the noise in the background is all that rain. Sorry. So he is not just Spanish. Let me just say he is Castilian. He is called the Castilian, the Castilian Hotel Clerk. And with apologies to all the Castilians in the audience, civilian Castilians reading English dialogue have fairly, you know, interesting accents. I, I don't want to insult. Uh, uh, they're, they're probably, they're kind of funny accents, but they're probably not funny to other Castilians. So with apologies. But most importantly, the reason I, I invented the Castilian Hotel Clerk, I mean, he wasn't, a, there, 
there was maybe a hotel clerk in the original, maybe, I, I don't know, but I don't think we remember him. But I did that because I wanted to get that information in, I wanted to create that scene. And, and by using distinctive accents and Scots accents and Welsh accents and all other kinds of accents and American, you know, uh, what they do is they, um, uh, they, they instantly, for me, it's a way for me to, to build a character and identify a character right off the bat. So it helps me with the shorthand of this kind of play. So that's why that's why the Castilian uh, uh, hotel clerk exists. There's somebody I see an actor. Yes, Ryan, tell us who's joined you. Hey, I'm you actor was stuck in here. I snuck in. This you is Richard so Eaton, who plays <laughs> Sherlock. <laughs> uh, it's been so much. It's been so much fun. Um, creating the world of the play, hasn't it? It has, yeah. It's been exhausting, but fun. <laughs> it was especially hot tonight in the show, though I am not one to complain because I don't have any quick changes compared to those guys. Yeah, so right, uh, yeah. they're, they're the ones running around making Watson and I look great. But you, are, you are wearing a velvet smoking jacket at one point, <laughs> and then plus the Holmes cape. I am, yeah. yeah, and I forget. <clears throat> There's a, a fair bit of overdressing, but I, yeah, again, it's it's all good. Thank you, you for creating such a mad world. Congratulations. Wow. <laughs> I just thought, so, it, in terms of the, some of the questions coming up, it might be useful to get an actor's point of view so he can tell the truth rather than yeah, the kind of director's exactly. point. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I was going to ask Ryan about some of the, the challenges in directing the scene we just watched, but, uh, you know, it, the challenges from the actor's point of view might be different, so we'd love to hear from both of you. Yeah, so we just watched, uh, were you watching in the bar? We I did watched, see it, yeah. Hello to everyone in the bar. Um, we just watched the, uh, uh, the hotel sequence. So yeah, that's a, that's a really tricky one because let's just take, for instance, actor three, Naomi's track in that. She um, starts as Cartwright moving into that scene. She then becomes the baby and then she becomes the German maid. Now she does all of those changes in the concierge booth. So she's in this cramped little booth trying to do it all within the, the space of there so that she can kind of keep reappearing as all of these characters. We've also got our first uh, introduction of Lestrade there. Um, so set, setting him up and he only gets that kind of one um, uh, scene to set him up before we reintroduce to, to him again at the end. So it's, it's, he's got to really make an impact. So he does lots of swearing, as you notice there. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then he becomes Sir Henry. He's got three lines to become Sir Henry. So, you know, Ken has really set the bar high there. Yeah. And, and early on in rehearsals, we were kind of uh, being nice, uh, you know, we all get on very well as a cast. So we were slowing things down during those quick changes to make sure that people made it on. And then at one point, Ryan was going, right, speed everything up now. If they're not on, they've got to be on. So everything got a lot faster, especially in, in act two at the start of act two with this sort of dumb show that's going on. I was giving them so much breathing space and then Ryan said, no, no. you've got to be brutal. This thing's got to move along like a, like a freight train. That's it, keep, keep the momentum going. What was the, what was the, um, pass, the kind of uh, expression in rehearsals? What was that? Fast, fun and furious. Fast, fun and furious. Keep it going, keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yay. Good, be tough. Get, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know the, as as it goes on and the weeks go on, they might slow up a little. So keep your oh, eyes. Already, on. that was that was my notes tonight, Ken. As I was watching the show tonight, yeah. Already, people starting to relax a little bit. So like, no, keep it, keep it going. <laughs> it's such, it's got to be such a tight show because if you miss one of those changes, uh, I mean, what you've done brilliantly is that you've put into the text some deliberate uh, things that go wrong. So, for instance, uh, Cartwright. Uh, gets caught off stage and that's written into the text and I think that's right. such a clever way of doing it so then that whatever goes wrong from that moment onwards it looks like it's all part of the show and it's all part <laughs> of the idea even when uh, thing, crazy things are happening yeah uh, <laughs> this afternoon, like this afternoon yeah. we, we won't talk about that <laughs> <laughs> so a little kindness and a little cruelty there Ken yes that's a subtle that's... blend of the two yeah <laughs> Well, we do have one more scene uh, that we're gonna see from Mercury Theater's production to share. Uh, this one has some pretty remarkable design choices, gives us a window into the characters of Holmes and Watson a little bit more. Ryan, will you set this one up for us too? Yeah, of course. So this, is, this actually takes place before the last one. So this is when Holmes and Watson discover that um, <laughs> that, he, that Sir Henry is being followed. So it's just di directly before. So um, Holmes is suspicious because of um, the, the letter that they've received um, uh, saying, uh, warning Sir Henry about the curse. And so uh, he, uh, he asked them to return. He asked Sir Henry and Dr. Mortis to return to the hotel and then Holmes follows them. And we see what happens now 
when as Holmes follows them uh, back to the hotel. I hope that made some semblance of sense. <laughs> Over to you, Rosie. Hey. Not a moment to lose. What? What is it? Shall I stop them? Not for the world, dear fellow. We'll follow them at about 50 yards. Quickly! Quickly! Into the streets! Good Lord, it's pouring out here! Keep them in view! Look, Holmes, they're stopping at a window, duck at this door. Look there. See that cab with the man inside, the one with the black beard? It's stopping on the other side of the street. Now it's moving slowly forward again. It's following Sir Henry and Dr. Mortimer. Oh, I say, he spotted us. Get back. Sherlock Holmes. Too late. Move, move, quickly. I can tell him. What a dolt! I'm an idiot! My God, I'm a babe in the woods. I trust, Watson, if you are an honest man, you will record this blunder of mine in your memoirs along with the successes you keep writing about. But who was the man? I have no idea. Well, how did you know that he would see... Watson, please... It is evident from all we have seen that Sir Henry has been closely shadowed since arriving in London, but I thought his pursuer would be on foot, not in a cab. Oh, it's a pity we didn't get the number. My dear Watson, as clumsy as I've been, you don't think I've failed to get the number, do you? I have an idea. Come with me. Yes, there it is. The messenger office. Come inside. Mr. Holmes, what a pleasure to see you so. Lucy, it's Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. <laughs> I'm afraid she's got a bit deaf, like her mother, who couldn't hear a freight train if it was running her down. But, Lucy! Oh, my saints, it's Mr. Holmes and the dear doctor. Oh, we'll never forget what you gentlemen did for well, us. Well, that's no business left. He'd be rotting in jail, as he ought to be. You're lovely to say it. What? You're lovely. Oh. Last man that called me, lovely, the father of my children. <laughs> uh, now, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Just two items. First, I would like to send a wire to the cab authority. Tell them I seek the identity of the woman who drives the cab, number 2704. Woman? Come, Watson, you didn't notice. I'll do it this instant, sir. Also, amongst your messenger boys, I recall you have a lad named Cartwright who's done some errands for me in the past. Is he here? Who? Oh, Cartwright! Oh, he's a good lad, he is. Oh, I'll fetch you for you. He's been one of our regular sets. Can't write! Get down here! It's Mr. Rose to see you! Also, if you'd be so kind, I'd like a moment alone with him. What, what? Alone! Well, of course you feel alone, Doctor. You need a wife to take care of you. Can't write! Here I am, sir! Let me get to it. What? We're going away. No, I don't think we should start. Oh. Hello, Mr. Rose. Doctor? Can't write? How are the rest of the boys? The irregular, sir. Well, they're doing all right with the old job now and then. Of course, they wouldn't say no to a little extra work on their plates if it came to calling in the scheme of things. We certainly wouldn't. Who's that? The name's Milker, sir. I work with Cartwright when there's a shilling or two in circulation, if you see what I mean. If you catch his drift. So what do you think? Oh, fine, fine. We can speed things up. Now, do you boys see this hotel directory? Oh, I see him. There are 23 hotels listed in the neighbourhood of Charing Cross. Oh, I see him. Got it. You are to visit each of them in turn. Yes, sir! You will begin in each <laughs> case by giving the porter one shilling. Get yes, it! You will tell him that you want to see yesterday's refuge. You will say that you are looking for a lost telegram. Yes, sir! But what you are really <laughs> looking for is this page of the Times with some words cut out. Get yes, it! Would you both stop saying yes, sir? Yes, yes sir! sir! Oh, now. In about 20 cases, the waste of the day before will have been burnt. But in the other three cases, you will be shown a heap of paper and you will look for this page of the Times among it. Now, the odds are enormously against your finding it and I want to report as soon as possible. Yes, sir! You got it, sir! And may I say what a pleasure it is entering your employment, Mr Holmes? And you, Dr Watson? And now! Like a runaway horse! Or a speedy train! Choo! 
Or a spotted leopard. Arr! Or a TD in a bowl. Or a phantom. Or a ghost. Boo. Or a bullet. Or a sound. <laughs> We're off. <laughs> so great. <laughs> what a great job. Oh my God. You guys are terrific. This it's so terrific. It's lovely. Yeah. Great, yeah. Yeah. Very lovely. Yeah, that is just wonderful work. I love I love the use of this set and the, the projections and everything. Yeah, um, so I have to, yeah, that's Amy Jane Cook's our set designer. Uh, she just name checked them because they did put a lot of work into it. And um Louise Rhodes Brown was our video designer as well. Yeah. Very really, really two talented women. Wonderful. Wonderful. Ken, this is one of those really inherently theatrical scenes, right? It's an amazing example of what you can only do on stage, like Ryan was talking about earlier. What, what can't Netflix give us? How did you embrace the challenge of writing the action across settings and doubling the roles in such quick succession? Well, I was very aware, of course, uh, and that's once uh, you, you asked me, Ryan, you know, why, how'd I get into the theater? What's the backstory? And in a way you don't end up being, becoming a playwright unless for some reason you have that, a good visual sense of where all the characters are. Now in the old days, they used to have, you know, uh, or certainly a, a Kaufman and Hart, you know, man who came to dinner must have 40 actors. So you've got a lot of people to keep, keep, keep in touch with, but, you, but you don't have much doubling. And even today, if you do it, you need a pretty big cast. Well, this is doubling, doubling, doubling. So what I was aware of all the time is where everybody is and how much time they needed to change. So when the two proprietors of the uh, uh, of the store go off, one of them comes back, and I can't remember if it, if it's the one playing the man or one playing the woman comes back as as uh, as uh, Cartwright, and then suddenly there's Milker. So I, I had to always do enough dialogue to give them time to do those things, and I was really aware of that. But but meanwhile, dramaturgically. I mean, the, the, the real answer, Ashley, to your question is, is that, you know, always, always as a playwright, tell the story. You know, that's the best advice I can ever give to any playwright. Yes, you, you want, if it's a comedy, you want laugh lines and you want those moments. If it's, if it's any piece of art, you, you, you know, there are places that you want to provoke tears when you want to tell your story, be it a political story or a social story. But, you know, you, you've got to never stop to do that. You, you never, you know, write in a way that, that uh, uh, sounds like you're doing any of those things. You always do them in, in radio, radio Mace, which is, is, is that you, you, um, you, you tell the story. And as long as you're always telling the story, you're on, on, on track. And that's what I tried to do in the play. I think you did that for sure. Um, it is a really expansive story in the novel, Conan Doyle's story. It goes to a lot of different places. Um, lots of big sweeping open spaces out in Dartmoor. Ryan, how did you, you, you name check your designers. How did you guys design the, the show with the lightning changes? And did this open up opportunities for you that that kind of realist telling that TV and film do so well? Um, maybe can't accomplish actually. Yeah, that, I mean that was the attraction to doing the show. The fact that there is you know twenty seven locations and you have to jump in the blink of an eye from one to the next. So um, so so obviously one of the first decisions we made was that we wanted to use video. But we've I think you can tell from the clip there that we haven't gone for a kind of photorealistic kind of video. It's very kind of uh, grainy and of the time. It was kind of influenced by the uh, opening credits to Robert Downey Jr.'s version of uh, Sherlock Holmes. That kind of so there's a kind of pa a kind of papyrus kind of quality to um, uh, to the visuals. Uh, yeah, and so, and then we started to have fun with that. So we have a sequence, for instance, where they're running across the moors, uh, and every time they change direction, they kind of run for like you know five steps one way and then five steps the other. The the, the video is changing behind them, so we're showing their kind of progression across the moors and different kind of vistas and so on. Uh, and then, for instance, when we go to the uh, station, um, part part of the, in the in Act Two, uh, the Coombe Tracy station. Part of the fun is is that they run around the set, and as they jump. The, the, that triggers the video and the, st and the steam train and everything. So it kind of, you know, appears like that. So I love that kind of, that kind of filmic visual storytelling. Um, and, the, and I suppose the other thing that we embrace that 
you just can't do on Netflix is that is the kind of turning of turning furniture and props into different sorts of things. So, for instance, the suitcases become train seats uh, and then they become seats in the trap. Uh, and then what else do we what else do we have? We have a desk. Dr. Mortimer's desk spins around and that becomes the black tour. So what we're doing is all the time we're asking the audience to um, go with us on this journey and to use their imaginations. Whereas and obviously on Netflix, you know, they've got the budget to be able to do all of that for you. They give you the imagination. We and I think this is what makes theatre so special is that we all collectively sit together uh, and we watch these five actors become all of these different characters and tell us this story. And, and magically, a suitcase turns into a, you know, a train seat. Wow. You heard it here, folks. This is magic you can't get on Netflix. <laughs> I feel like we're really dissing Netflix. Listen, Netflix, Netflix is fine. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you're the sort of person who likes that sort of thing. That's the sort of thing you like. <laughs> I have to also, you know, say, say you know, uh, you mentioned uh, 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 the designer. Now, the designer also, the designer you mentioned, did she also do the costumes? She did, yes, she yes, she did the costumes, and, and she said it nearly broke her, Ken. So I'm holding you responsible for that. I said she's she said she spent ages researching all of the quick changes, and for those of you that will be directing this or producing this later on in the season, is that she was watching all of the um, Cinderella quick changes on the Broadway quick changes on YouTube. You know all those kind of you know if you if you she was Goog spent a lot of time googling and YouTubing uh, quick changes and those ones that the magicians do where you got to do it so fast where the magnets rip and. And, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing the work she put into that. And I have to say, um, uh, Steve Mayo as well, who did our sound design, he, he became like the sixth character. He was very, we introduced him very early into rehearsals, uh, didn't we? And we did. And we were kind of cruel because every five seconds, Ryan was going, and there'll be a sound effect there. And you could just see Steve <laughs> sort of sweating at the back of the room <laughs> as he had to supply yet another sound effect. But can I just say that's the second time that Richard used the cruel word and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to get the message. That's what I want to say. <laughs> is he this way, wait a second, I have a question for you. Is he this way on all productions? Is he always cruel and mean? Or... Oh yeah, always, yeah, yeah. He yeah. rules with an iron fist. <laughs> that's what I like to hear, good. <laughs> <laughs> Only way to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have a uh, just around 15 minutes uh, to do uh, some questions. We have a couple of questions that have come up in the chat. And also, uh, I think uh, Michelle is in the bar there at Mercury and can take some live questions. So, um, Michelle, by all means, go ahead and turn your camera on and, and uh, let us join you in the bar. And while you're doing that, I am going to ask a question or two from the chat. Hi, bar folks. Hi, thanks for coming. <laughs> so glad you're here. Yeah, we, we were with you. Thanks for coming. Oh yeah, boy, we were with you. Uh, yeah. So a couple questions that have come up in the chat as we've been talking. Um, one is uh, that uh, this is for Ryan, a, kind of a, a quick change question. In act two, scene 12, Lestrade and Sir Henry, this is a question from Dave, Lestrade and Sir Henry, who are played by the same actor, are on stage at the same time. How did you accomplish that? Uh, that that's great. And that, we spent ages in rehearsals trying all sorts of different things. So originally, we were going to do hats. It was just hats. We we're just literally just talking different hats, stealing a little bit from the 39 steps. But uh, we had this idea in rehearsal that we did split costume. So it's half Lestrade and half um, uh, Sir Henry. And it, it gets a round of applause every night. We can't believe it. So what happens is, is Sir Henry comes on and he runs on backwards and no one notices that. No, not Sir Henry, Lestrade. Oh, Lestrade he comes on and no one notices that he's running backwards. And then uh, she says, oh, uh, where's Sir Henry? And then he does it. He just, just does this turn and becomes Sir Henry. Audience go wild every night, don't they? They do. And we're opposite him on stage. So from our perspective, He's literally half and half, and it's so obvious what's about to happen. But from the audience's point of view, they have no idea. And you can hear people audibly gasp when it happens. <laughs> we had a magician, <laughs> we had a magician friend come and watch it, and he says, I don't know how you got that past me. Is it really? He just turned around. <laughs> wow. Bravo. That's fantastic. That is just stage magic at its best. And it's um, most boiled down. <laughs> That is so he's got, is I don't know if you noticed, but he's got the beard. So he's got half the beard on and everything. Yeah. <laughs> if you can, if you can, I know it's asking a lot, but at some point before you guys close, send me a picture of both sides or a little, a little on your phone, video it 
or yeah. something. I'd love, to, I'd love, to, that would be great. And just send it to me. I'd love that. We'll do that. We'll get that done. Thanks, thanks. That's great. We have a question from uh, Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie, uh, who wants, she says she hasn't read the text of the show yet, but uh, wants to know whether the stylization, that kind of choreographed dance-like quality in the clips is described in the play script or is that part of uh, the direction? Ken, do you, want to, do, you, do you want to say that one? I'll start and you take it over. It's not described in the play script whatsoever. And this is one of the things when I said uh, at the beginning of this whole thing is, you know, one of the reasons I started this play club, it's kind of like a book club, but you read plays instead. And I get people used to reading plays because it's great because they're like, sh they're short, they don't take much time. You have stage directions, but they can't, they're like blueprints. A, a, a play, no matter what you do, is like a blueprint. And you hand that blueprint over to uh, 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 great professionals. Uh, like Ryan and his actors and his designers. And you say, now you interpret it and you do it the way you want to do it and the way you see it. And that's the real joy of doing it, that. So all that stylization came from Ryan and his uh, and his cast and, and, and um, designers. Yeah, and you know, with, with without um, you know, sounding too uh, wanky for want of a better expression, it, it is. Set, I think it is set up in script in the script. The theater, the innate theatricality of the script, uh, forces the director's hand to make big, bold uh, choices, uh, and the madcap nature of the text as well. I think is the, because what's really interesting as the piece goes on is that uh, it start, the, the exposition at the beginning, I think is fantastic. There's a brilliant prologue, which sets up the kind of thriller element to it. Then we go into the case and we set up the, the hound and the audience is just slowly starting to clock that it's um, the same actors playing the same characters, you know, and playing to, sorry, different characters, sorry. And then that escalates and escalates and escalates so that by the end where you're doing all of these quick changes and you get that round of applause for the, the double Lestrade, Sir Henry, it's it's such a joy to watch. It feels it feels wild. It feels like the kind of, your world is unraveling as you're watching it because it's so uh, silly and, uh, and uh, crazy. Though I have to say I did overhear a conversation on the first night from a member in, of them uh, who'd watched it. They're saying, do you know what? I think it's the same actors playing the same people. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, really? <laughs> you look through the program yeah. for more people. Yeah, there's, I think there's only five actors in this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Does, that answer, does that answer the question? I hope it does. <laughs> I think so. Amazing hopes. Um, let's, uh, let's throw it to the bar and see if we can get a question there, Michelle. Yeah, we have a question here. Can you hear us okay? Absolutely. Yeah, hello, bar. Hi, Hi, um, really enjoyed it. Really, really did enjoy it. Almost family here. Um, my question is, is, is the second scene that you showed just then that really resonated with me with Morecambe and Wise. I'm a big fan anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, I was surprised that Ken is American, but yeah. that's very, very, uh, for, for us growing up with Morecambe and Wise, it did seem to have those elements and that British humour. And I was wondering how... Ryan was a was it Ryan that wrote that into it or, or, or directed that into it or the actors uh, did you play off the strengths of the actors the British actors in this case uh, or was that written by Ken did you follow that I mean you, you probably just answered that in the previous question to be honest <laughs> no I think no I think you're I think you're absolutely right. that's a really good question I think it, it I, it's I'd say 80 percent Ken's writing uh, and then it's then our interpretation of it and you're absolutely right I mean I grew up loving Morecambe and Wise, Two Ronnies, you know, all of that humour, like, you know, I just steal from all the time, you know, with, you know, without batting an eyelid. Uh, and I suppose, that, I suppose that, I suppose that's in the same with you, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And yeah, and, and I suppose all that sort of American music hall, uh, those comedians as well, were in that similar vein that they all came from that great tradition of clowning. But just to point out, we're not all British actors. We do have an American hiding amongst us. Can you guess who? Well, I wanted to say, of course, it's uh, Sir Henry. Sir Henry, but his, his, his accent was impeccable. Uh, he's, he is a Brit. He's from the Northeast. It is he's a, a Geordie. He's yeah. a Geordie. It's Watson. What? Dr. Watson's American from oh Utah. God. Oh, my God. From Mormon State. Yeah. Well, congrats to every All the actors are incredible. But, you know, usually, <laughs> I, and the, to, answer, to answer your question, uh, uh, the gentleman who asked the question, what's your name? Can you shout? It's Carl. Carl. Hey, Carl. 
Thanks. It is, uh, but to answer your question is I'm a huge Morecambe and Wise fan and I'm a huge Two Ronnies fan. And uh, I, I didn't grow up in the sense that that's not what we normally saw growing up, but I did university in England. I'm a huge Anglophile. And of course, if you love theater, you know, you know, you spend your life learning, you know, English theater, because it's the greatest thing in the whole world. I mean, we don't come close. I'm sorry, I'll get, I'll get attacked by everybody in my world. But you know, it's different. But anyway, it's so great. And so I, and I've spent my life loving Morecambe and Wise, I could, I could watch their breakfast routine, you know, in the kitchen. Oh, genius. I must have watched it 100 times, but I could watch it. And I could go to my grave thinking about that. And that, that, in my moment it's so great so yes thanks for pointing that out but yeah for sure i'm gonna hide now. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there's another question from the bar i'll be happy to take one there she's harang haranguing them now <laughs> they're all really happy with their beer and their uh and their shot yeah they're all very right. shy <laughs> that's fair enough uh, we have a couple others from the the chat, and uh, let's see here. Oh, Ken, have you ever thought of a parallel between Holmes and Watson and your old role of Higgins with Pickering? <laughs> My old role. I don't know who wrote that in, but yes, <laughs> that's a question from Mark. School. What you? Where? What that's you a say? question from Mark. Mark, oh wow. Well, uh, I did play Sir Henry Higgins in My Fair Lady in high school, and I want to say uh, it was memorable. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, there were some uh, uh, who said that it was the greatest Henry Higgins they e e ever saw. It was said, let me put it this way, it was said it was the greatest Henry Higgins ever on stage. It was said by my mother, but it was said. Uh, That's good. Uh, yeah, so absolutely. Look, Holmes and Watson, they are the great... They're so iconic, you know. You you read the stories and you hear their voices in our heads, and and uh, and, and uh, of course, of course, uh, Shaw drew on them when he was writing uh, uh, Pygmalion. Pygmalion, don't forget, is is nineteen fifteen. Uh, I believe I'm right about that. Uh, uh, and um, uh, Conan Doyle had already written by the the bulk of the Sherlock Holmes stories, which had were just as popular then as they are now they took took the world by storm so he certainly knew them and i'd say there's they're they're one of the many examples of playwrights and other writers drawing on holmes and watson so yeah it was it's interesting there's a there's a batman and robin quality uh to this particular uh holmes and watson as well and i wonder if but if they, if they, because Batman's very similar, isn't he? Batman and Holmes, in terms of the the brilliant detective, very. Batman. There's a lot of similarities. And watching these two running around the stage after one another. Listen, you put me in a cape. <laughs> these things are going to happen. There's a there's a poster for the 1965 film uh, that is called uh, "Study in Terror," and the poster is Holmes and with the uh, with the Kate billing behind him, the original Caped Crusader. Nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah. I told you she knew a lot about Sherlock yeah. Holmes. Yeah. That, that is amazing, that knowledge. Uh, so we have a, a couple other questions. We're just about out of time, but uh, Bonnie wants to know, Ken, if you uh, read aloud to yourself while you're writing. Oh yeah, I, I, I guess I do. I closet myself completely and, uh, and I write by hand. And yeah, I do catch myself. Of course I do. Yeah. Because you got to hear all the voices in your head. Great question. And the answer is yes. <laughs> and then we also have a follow up to the question about that scene with uh, Sir Henry and Lestrade. Ken, did you have anything in mind when you wrote that? Or were you just creating an intractable problem and just throwing it at the director? created an intractable problem, absolutely throw the director in the first production, which was the world premiere was here uh, in the United States, is they solved it with hats. And that I think that I wrote that in, Ryan, from what you said, you sort of said, oh, hats were, I think I wrote it in the script that way, because, you know, yeah. you turn and you make, and it got, it didn't get around, but it got a good reaction. But it sounds like you solved it in a mo wonderful, wonderful, incredible way. So better way. I didn't mean to say that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have any final questions from the bar? We have time for maybe one more question if there's anybody in the bar who wants to ask. 
Okay. It's just like, no, 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 we only have questions for our beer. Okay. It's, it's, very, late. it's very late here. It's nearly 11 Very late. Yes, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you for coming and staying. It's really sweet of you. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Ken, if you have any uh, final remarks that you want to make, the rest of us can uh, can go off and go All right, to bed. I'll, or I'll, I'll just get, get off. breakfast I'll or get dinner. Honest. Say the final thing, which because we are out of time and it is an hour exactly. So thanks for keeping to that. Is uh, uh, is thanks to Ryan, thanks to Rosie, thanks to Ashley, uh, and thanks to the incredible whole cast and the designers. Amazing, amazing, and it's so sweet of you to join me. You know, this really is dear to my heart. The idea of creating this play club, and I hope you guys will sign. People will sign up to get. You see the newsletter will tell you and, and whatever it is. But but uh, it's, it, you know we have to learn to, to read it when we can't see plays. So read them and and then go to the theater. Go to the theater and go see comedies. And uh, Ryan, the Mercury Theater has just, you've outdone yourselves, you guys, and, and I'm uh, very grateful to you. It's been an absolute pleasure to work on. It really has, Ken, really, a real dream. So reading Treasure Island next. <laughs> oh, good, oh, good, oh, good. We should, we gotta talk. And I, I, I'm coming to England soon, so we'll get together. Yeah, so. that'd be great. And great. lovely, and, th and just thanks to all of our bar uh, team that stayed stayed and, uh, and watched there. Really lovely to see you all. Thanks for, thanks for supporting, yay. So much. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to hit leave. Should I do it? Or Rosie? No, I can't. Le Rosie, you do it. I get to close it. Okay. You, Rosie. Rosie's the guru. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Ashley. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.